In this video, I'm gonna give you my final picks for UFC 283. We're gonna go deep into DraftKings strategy in this video. I'm gonna bring back a segment that a lot of you liked, and we're going to give you some free money, so make sure you watch until the end. As always, you can call me Kunith. Let's make some money this week. I'm gonna try my best to keep my energy high because this is the second time we're recording this video. Spent forever recording this video last night, woke up to edit it, found out that Oscar just ruined the audio yesterday, you piece of garbage. But we're back, we'll get through this and understand this, persistence doesn't recognize failure, believe it. If you haven't already, go back and watch the predictions video from earlier in the week. That's where we go over the entire card fight by fight. We talk about spots that we like, spots that we don't like. I'm gonna have that linked right in the top of the description so if you haven't seen it yet stop go look at that and that'll give you a good base and knowledge coming into this one but this is the final picks where we talk about strategy and normally we start talking about changes and there haven't been any changes but i'm going to be optimistic i think that things are looking good and i think we have a nice healthy 15 fight card to work with and i'm excited to get into it for you so we'll start with value plays and these are plays at 8,000 and below these are pieces that you're going to need to place in your lineups to make everything work salary wise and our first value play of the week is going to be Brandon Moreno and he's sitting there at 8,000 right at the top. Like we talked about earlier in the week, I like Brandon Moreno to win here. He's got 25 minutes to work, giving him access to a really high scoring ceiling and we know how he fights by now. He likes to brawl, a lot of pressure, a lot of strikes. He can mix in his takedowns if he wants to. We saw him take down Davis and Figueredo four times in their first meeting, two times in their second and one time in their third. I think physically, at least at this weight class, he has a lot of advantages at this point, Davison Figueredo is now 35 years old. Brandon Moreno is still 29. Davison Figueredo is really muscle bound. Brandon Moreno is more slender. And for Figueredo, it's going to be difficult for him to make weight. And it's always difficult for him to make weight. But the older he gets, the harder it's going to be. And this is the good situation for Brandon Moreno, in my opinion. Not only that, but he's exiting the division. You're not going to see Davison Figueredo fight at flyweight anymore. This is his final fight down here because he just can't make it anymore. I think all roads lead to Brandon Moreno wins a pretty decisive decision by stealing rounds four, rounds five, and then having the judges give him one or two of the first three rounds. Last time against Kai Car France, he looked okay until he didn't, until he looked great. He folded Kai Car France like a wallet with a body kick, and if he starts landing that this week against Davis and Figueredo, the gas tank is going to go lower and lower and lower. He's going to be somebody who pulls a ton of ownership, just the name value, the scoring ceiling, the co-main event spot, but it's totally warranted. You're going to need the winner of the co-main event in your lineups given the way that the salaries shake out and this is the side that i prefer to be on good value here at 8,000. now our next value comes in the form of the main event we've got glover Teixeira coming back at 7800 now i fully expect jamal hill to win this fight but it's not a lock if you're watching this you probably watch enough ufc or consume enough predictions content to understand the way that this fight goes anyway either jamal hill knocks Teixeira out or glover's able to get him to the mat round and pound TKO finish from there or he finds a submission which is much more likely I'm thinking either arm triangle or rear naked choke if he does win but for Glover to win a decision here I think it's very unlikely I don't think that Glover at his age with his speed or lack thereof and what we've seen out of his chin in the past I don't think he's going to be able to stand across from Jamal Hill for 25 minutes so if he wins it's inside the distance and that builds value into his price sometimes it's beneficial to play the leverage game and not touch the main event or the co-main event these five rounds fights but I don't think this is a situation where that happens I think one of these guys gets finished the price is right for both of them I think you're going to need the winner of that fight in your lineup and for that reason Glover Teixeira is one of our value plays this week now our next value play is a value for a couple of reasons I think this is another fight that you probably need to target if you want to win on DraftKings this week we know how Terrence McKinney fights by now it's kill or be killed he's never going to see a judge's scorecard he hasn't so far and I don't think that changes anytime soon and I don't think that changes with this fight either. Terrence McKinney's very, very good, and he's very, very dangerous. We talked a lot about this during the predictions video. I think that Terrence McKinney has a 50-50 shot against anybody in the world, but it's exactly that, a 50-50 shot. I would not be surprised if we see Terrence McKinney not be able to put this guy away in the first five minutes and then Bonfim bomb on him in the second round and put him out. Because Terrence McKinney, realistically, at the pace that he fights with, if he fights some guy who's willing to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with him and take some of the offense that he throws back at them, he's got about 
about three to four minutes of gas. And I talked about this point a little bit on the live show that I did with Angelo over at We Want Picks. If you haven't seen that, it's long. We both give our picks. We had a good time. You should check it out. But I talked about how a lot of fighters will train the way that they fight. You see Alexander Volkanovsky trains the way that he fights if you ever watch training footage. Somebody like Sean Strickland literally trains the way that he fights in four ounce gloves, no headgear. The technique is largely the same. But when you look at Terrence McKinney, there's no way that he's training the way that he's fighting these guys in the octagon because he'd get kicked out of every gym in America if he was throwing full power, full speed, heavy hooks from the opening second that sparring started. So that leads me to believe that when he gets in the octagon, there's just adrenaline, pure adrenaline, mix that with his athleticism, mix that with his power, his aggression, and you just have a storm that he's going to throw at you for those first couple minutes. But you weather that storm, this guy has nothing left. Terrence McKinney, when he's fresh, is a 50-50, maybe 70-30 fighter against anybody in the world. But when Terrence McKinney is tired, it's flipped. And Ishmael Bonfim is solid. And this is a guy who is going to get slept on. He's going to be way under owned this week, considering how many people are going to be on T-Rex. Good leverage, good value, because you know that if this fight ends, it's inside the distance. At 7,700, I will take that all day. Now, our next value play is somebody who I don't expect to win. And I'll tell you right now, if you watched anything out there, I am in the minority here. Daniel Marcos. Everybody's dark this week. Everybody has Daniel Marcos to win. And it's valid. I mean, the guy is solid. If you watched him fight on Contender Series or even before that, on the feet, this guy is a handful. He's undefeated for a reason. He's done good work outside of the UFC. He did good work on the Contender Series. He looks like a very natural striker in there. He puts punches and kicks together easily. He looks fluid. But on the mat, the guy is at a huge disadvantage. I think that Simon Oliveira is worlds above him when it comes to the grappling. And if the fight gets to the mat, which a lot of UFC fights do, I think that Oliveira is going to be in a really good spot. Even in transitions, I could see Oliveira somehow getting onto the back. Even from a standing position, Marcos isn't able to get him off, ties up a rear naked choke, wins. This guy is making a UFC debut. First fight on the card in Brazil against a Brazilian. Just a ton of emotional factors going against them this week. And if he loses, he doesn't lose any stock. If he wins, he gains a little bit of stock. But I don't think this is a situation where he's in a must-win position. And I don't think that Simon Oliveira is going to roll over like he did against Tony Gravely. And by the way, if Tony Gravely fought Daniel Marcos, he would spend all 15 minutes flat on his back. But I had to talk about him here during the value plays because I assume a lot of people are going to get here. And if you were playing Daniel Marcos this week, that's fine. But just know I'm not doing it. Now our next value play comes at $7,400 Munir Lezez. Lezez is a cool pick for me this week because I think he's going to be able to keep his feet. I think he outstrikes Gabriel Bonfim. And I think that he throws north of 100 strikes later lands north of 100 significant strikes and scores a decent amount of DraftKings points in a decision win. Gabriel Bonfim does have power. Gabriel Bonfim has good technique and he's going to be the better fighter when this fight hits the mat if it ever gets there. But I do like Manir Lezez to be able to move well, keep his hands busy, disrupt the timing of Bonfim and again win a decision. I think that Gabriel Bonfim is somebody who's going to pull a decent amount of ownership so you're getting good leverage here with Munir Lezez. And while I don't think that his ceiling is crazy high because you could have a situation just like like Angelusa, where he lands 141 significant strikes, only scores 88 points, but down at this price, that might be okay. Because what he does is he makes a lot of things work in your lineup. I think he's the better fighter here on Feem fighting after his brother, making his debut in front of a live crowd, just like the last fight that we talked about. A lot of emotional factors here, but Manir Lizetz is a professional, 35 years old. He's been doing it for a while, and he's somebody who has UFC experience under his belt. I don't think that the moment is going to be too big for him. I don't know if I could say the same for Gabriel Bonfim. So give me Munir Lezez this week, one of the better underdogs in my opinion, and somebody who I'm going to put in a lot of my lineups to make the salary work. Good value there. Now, if we come down here, another guy who's a sneaky play this week is Luan Lacerda. And the reason why he's a value play is because of his win condition. We know that if Luan Lacerda wins, it's not going to be by decision. It's likely a submission. It might be one off of his back, which kind of limits the ceiling because that means he's not going to be the one getting the takedown. He might not get a reverse either. I think that Luan Lacerda though has an opportunity here, especially if Cody Stamen starts shooting and shooting and shooting for takedowns as he's one to do. I think the opportunity is right then and there. Luan Lacerda grabs up a guillotine, low percentage choke, not something that I like to see a fighter that I'm betting on do, but when fighters pull it off and they get it the right way, it could pay off. It's one of those techniques. It's not like an arm bar or a Kimura that slowly develops. At least it feels like it's slowly developing when you're watching it. Based on what I've seen, in my opinion, I think that a guillotine is one of those binary submissions in MMA. You either have it right
right away or you don't. Take Dustin Poirier and Habib Nurmagomedov, for example, and this is something that you've seen in a ton of fights, but I'll just use those two as an example. Dustin Poirier drops into a guillotine, he has Khabib's head, and you think, oh no, Khabib might be in trouble, but if Khabib was really in trouble, he would have tapped right away, just because once that's cinched up, there's no getting out of it. If you have a guy in a guillotine and it's taking a while for you to get the tap, it's because it's not tight enough, and eventually, if they're composed enough, they're just going to get their body off to the proper side, poke their head out, create enough space, and then they'll be perfectly fine. But I think it's on the table for Luan Lacerda this week, who's a very good grappler. He's a better jujitsu player or jujitsu practitioner than Cody Stamen. My issue is Cody Stamen is super solid, very experienced, and if he gets takedowns, he could probably sit in the guard without any danger. So Luan Lacerda is not a must play, but nobody down at this price range is a must play. We talk about this all the time. When you're playing DraftKings, especially DraftKings for MMA, you're going to need to make some decisions that you don't feel comfortable with in the moment. You might not feel good about playing Luan Lacerda. You might not feel good about playing the next guy that I'm about to show you as the final value play. But normally when you look at the guy who wins the competition, you think, oh, I wouldn't have decided to play that person. So just keep that in mind. You have to take some risks here. You have to take some chances. And our final value play is going to come right here at $6,900 Neil Magny. Now, don't let the line for this fight fool you. The line is way too wide. And I'm actually going to change my prediction for this fight. All week I've been saying I do think that Gilbert Burns would win, but I can come up with more reasons why Neil Magny would win than Gilbert Burns would win. But Neil Magny is going to be rocking a nine inch reach advantage, a huge height advantage, and Gilbert Burns eats jabs like they're going out of business. So you saw Gilbert Burns dropped by a Kamaru Usman jab. Kamaru Usman, not known for having a ton of power, not known for having the sharpest hands, dropped him with a jab. Neil Magny coming out of a good fight camp. Neil Magny has seen everything that Gilbert Burns can throw his way. He fought D-Rod. D-Rod was supposed to be this heavy handed guy that can put him down. And I still do believe that about D-Rod. I think D-Rod is an absolute dog. And I thought he'd be able to give Neil Magny more trouble. I thought there was a chance he could knock him out. But you saw the way that he bounced back after his fight against Shavkat Rachmanov. And we've seen him dropped before in the past, of course. But I think the way that he conducted himself last time out, physical advantages that he has, the game plan that he should have coming into this, the length, the reach. Even if you think about when Gilbert Burns is closing distance, you have uppercuts and knees from Neil Magny. If they get into the clinch, the knee is going to be able to reach the target quickly because his knee is basically at his belly button anyway. So don't be surprised if you see Neil Magny touch, 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 move, butcher him to the body in the clinch and, and do some good work this week. Definitely somebody who's going to be good leverage because I think a ton of people are going to be on Gilbert Burns because of the price, because of the line. The, the Haitian sensation is totally live here. Give me some Neil Magny at this price. I think it makes a ton of sense. Historically, he doesn't score that well on DraftKings, but down at 6,900, just win, baby. But those are the value plays. So those are the pieces that are going to help make your lineups work. And we're about to build lineups in a second. But before we do, we've had a great stretch since the beginning of the new year with new subscribers. I appreciate a lot of you guys stopping in. Welcome. And make sure you like the video. I'm trying to hit 200 likes this time. I think we've eclipsed that number once. I know you have it in you. And now that we have that out of the way, we can start building some cash game lineups. And we'll start with cash games. We'll get into tournaments in a second, but we need cash games because that's where the real money is made. That's where you can make your consistent, steady money, increase your bankroll. I've talked about this in the past, but I know new people love when I talk about this. You don't need to go from either first in the contest or nothing. I know that's a philosophy that a lot of DFS players have, especially high level players, but realistically, that's not what we're looking to do at all. Yes, we want to win the contest. Yes, we want to take down tournaments. You want to take chances so you put yourself in a position to do that. But if you put all of your money into a contest and you just cash, it's not bad. <laughs> but if you do have that Ricky Bobby, if you ain't first your last mentality in your tournaments, that's fine because you can offset them with cash games. Because MMA DFS and cash game lineup go together like peanut butter and jelly, like pop and corn, like power slap and CTE. So with that being said, let's get into a cash game build. So normally you look to stack the main event. Given that I don't think this main event goes the distance, I'm going to stack the co-main event because I'm confident that that fight goes the distance, even though I will say this is something I said about Glover Teixeira's last fight and both of them scored all of the points, but I think this is a different kind of matchup that we have on our hands this week. So give me the co-main event to be stacked in the cash games. We have 8450 left over. A strong cash game punt, in my opinion, this week is Neil Magny. He'll probably be popular in your cash games, but if you play a lot of cash, you know that that doesn't really matter much. At this point, you have 8966 left over per fighter. I would come up here to Johnny Walker, who I think is very live for an early knock out. 
I would come up here to Greg Rodriguez, and I'd grab somebody like Tiago Moises, who is definitely live for a quick finish here, and somebody who has one of the best matchups on the entire card. You're going to see a lot of people try their hardest in cash games to get up to somebody like Jay Alton Almeida. I don't know if you necessarily need to do that. I think this is a strong spot for you to land. You can obviously tinker with this, change some things around if you want. Now, you can get up to Almeida if you want to. I don't think that's a bad idea. Tinker with this. Play with this. Get a cash game lineup that you feel good about. Cash game different than tournaments you want to feel good about your lineup in a contest like this but don't play a lineup in your cash games that you would ever play in your tournaments you would never play this in your tournament because it wouldn't make sense to only one time before have i seen two fighters in the same fight show up on the optimal lineup and that was rob font and marlon vera other than that it's not the case you are limiting yourself because you need six winners to win the tournaments in cash games you need about four or five and you're going to get a winner in moises and Rodriguez. I'm very confident about Johnny Walker. You're guaranteed a winner between Davis and Figueredo and Brandon Moreno. And then you have a good scoring floor if Neil Magny loses a decision and scores 30, 40 points. If you want to send me your cash game lineups, I'll take a look. You could send them over to Kunith MMA. Just send me a direct message. Tell me how many people are in your contest. And you can also send me tournament lineups as well. I'll take a look at those. Just let me know how many people are in your contest, if it's single entry or not, and I can give you my opinion. But for your 50 50s, head to heads, double ups i think that the lineup we just looked at is probably around where you should land tweak it a little bit and give it your own spin but i do think that that is probably the recipe this week now before we move into tournament lineups back by popular demand i'm going to go over over owned and under owned so three fighters that i think will be over owned three fighters that i think will be under owned and we'll use that as we start building these lineups so when we look at over owned fighters i think the first one is pretty obvious and that's going to be Dorino burns the notion that he's going to go out there and smoke neil Mann Magny is something that I just can't really get behind. I don't know if he finishes Neil Magny here. And every fighter says, oh, this is the best shape I've ever been in. I'm going to finish this guy. I'm going to make a statement. It's fighter talk. It's media talk. It's not something you should get wrapped up in. And I don't think these guys are saying that unintentionally. I think they fully do believe that that's what they're going to go out there and do. But when the cage door closes, everything changes a little bit. It goes from I'm going to murder this guy to, oh, I really need to win this fight because I just got my show money confirmed. Now I need my win money because I own a house. <laughs> <laughs> but if we just take a look at what Gilbert Burns has done at welterweight since he moved up, he's got the fight against the Russian where he scored 79 DraftKings points in a decision win. He had three takedowns in that fight, almost eight minutes of control time, only 79 DraftKings points at 9,300 does not get you there. His decision win against Gunnar Nelson where he scored 54 DraftKings points, obviously not going to get you there. Knocks out Damian Maya in the first round. I don't think a first round knockout is really on the table this week. A five round decision win over the the ghost of Tyron Woodley. I'll give him that 102 DraftKings points, but that is over a 25 minute span. And that was against a very smoked out Tyron Woodley. Gives a good account of himself in the Kamaru Usman fight. He doesn't record a knockdown, but he rocked Kamaru Usman. I think both his hands touched the mat. I thought that was a knockdown, but I guess not. But he scores 20 DraftKings points. He isn't able to take Kamaru Usman down, which no shame in that, but he does get dropped by a jab. And there's a little bit of shame in that. Kamaru Usman finishes him. Kamaru Usman doesn't typically finish a ton of people as it is so not a great look in my opinion wonder boy again over seven minutes of control time three takedowns and 84 DraftKings points at this price it doesn't get you there and then against Chemayev, close fight but even if he got that decision you're looking at 82 DraftKings points i'm not looking to pay this much for gilbert burns and i think a lot of people are going to get here because they think that it's going to knock neil magny out early and it's possible i'm not saying it's not but at the same time i think that neil magny will present a lot of challenges to gilbert burns early so if it takes Gilbert Burns a little while to figure out how to close distance effectively, how to land one of those big right hands or left hooks that he can throw out there. And then, yeah, I think that Neil Magny is going to be able to survive, extend him, and then Gilbert Burns' scoring ceiling gets lower and lower and lower as the fight wears on. And he might be falling in love with his hands. Last time out, obviously giving a good account of himself with Hamzat Chemaev, I think that he might want to throw hands this week. He might be willing to throw more hands than normal against Neil Magny. And I don't know if that's a good idea this week. So I think that Gilbert Burns goes over owned. Next, I'm looking at Gabriel Bonfim. Now I could be off here. I don't know if a ton of people are going to get here, but I think enough people will get here for me to consider him over owned this week. I'm not saying he's going to be the highest owned fighter on the slate, but I do think a lot of people are going to get here. Just the name recognition because of what he did on the contender series and his brother fighting on the card. Obviously the finishing upside, you look on his record, you see the finishes, think, okay, he probably goes in there and gets it done this week. But I don't think he wins this week, despite the price tag, despite the 
odds, despite the hype, despite being the favorite. I don't think that he wins this week. I think Lazez is a terrible matchup. And I think that Gabriel Bonfim goes over owned, not somebody that I'm looking to play this week at all. And then the last fighter that we're looking at, that's definitely going to go over owned. And we talked about this a little bit, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but Daniel Marcos, a lot of people are going to get here. I'm thinking around 40% in a lot of your contests, just given the way that the public is talking about him. I think that a lot of people are going to get here. And if he's your fighter in your lineup fighting first on the card, if he somehow gets submitted in the first round or second round and scores 12 points, you're going to be pissed. I'll add one fighter to this as well. I think Terrence McKinney definitely goes over owned and I'm not saying it's not warranted. We know that Terrence McKinney is probably going to win in the first 90 seconds if he does win this fight. But Terrence McKinney is going to be somebody whose ownership is going to rival the main event and the co-main event. He's going to be coming in in a lot of your contests, probably north of 50%. He's a very boom or bust play. Obviously, the ceiling is there. We know how T-Rex gives it up, but don't be surprised if a lot of people end up getting here. Might be warranted, totally, but I know for a fact that a ton of people are going to be wanting to play Terrence McKinney this week. Now, for the fighters that are going to go under-owned, I think right at the top of the slate, Jay Alton Almeida because of the price. Now, there are going to be a decent amount of people that try to get here just because of the price, because of the matchup, because Jay Alton Almeida averages a uh, <laughs> ceiling type score of 118 points. Definitely one of the strongest plays on the slate, has one of the best matchups on the slate, and has a fighting style that can get you there points wise. I don't think a ton of people will get here though because you're going to be forced to play a lot of underdogs. Now, if you're somebody who likes Brandon Moreno and Glover Teixeira and Daniel Marcos, then you'll probably find a way to get up to Jay Alton Almeida. But for those that don't like all three, if you can't check off all those boxes, you might have a hard time getting up here. And for that reason, I think that holds down his ownership a little bit. And I think that he's huge positive leverage this week. It's going to be hard for him to show up on the optimal lineup, considering that you're spending nearly a fifth of your salary just on this one guy alone. But a decent amount of underdogs come through. I think that Jay Alton Almeida could definitely put you in a good position, especially if he scores north of 115 DraftKings points. Another guy that's going to fly way under the radar this week is Tiago Moises, who has one of the best matchups on the entire card. Now, I'm not a big Tiago Moises guy. If you watched the video earlier in the week, you know how I feel about him, but I do think that this is an easy matchup and probably one of the best matchups on the card because he's going to be able to take this guy down and finish him pretty quickly, in my opinion. If he pulls what he did against Christos Yagos, where he secures a takedown in the first round and then is able to come up with a rear naked choke scoring north of 100 DraftKings points, he's probably going to be somebody that wins somebody a contest because not a ton of people are going to get here this week. If people are trying to play Jay Alton Almeida, if people are coming up to say Johnny Walker, Greg Rodriguez, these are all very good plays that I'm rattling off right now. It's going to be hard for you to get to Tiago Moises. So don't be surprised when he comes in below 20% in a lot of your contests. And if you're playing single entry stuff, you might see more of them because those players are a little bit sharper, but I still wouldn't be surprised if he doesn't garner a whole lot of ownership in those kinds of contests either. And then I think one of the biggest leverage plays in the entire slate is Simon Oliveira. Daniel Marcos is on the over-owned list. A lot of people are on Daniel Marcos. So on the flip side, you're going to see a lot of people not play Simon Oliveira, especially at his price. He's not cheap by any means. He's the first fight of the night. He, that left a bad taste in people's mouth because of his performance against Tony Gravely. Don't be surprised if Simon Oliveira comes in at 11%. And 9%, and he pulls a submission win in the first or second round, scoring between 90 and 105, then you're probably going to need him in your lineup. And he's somebody who a lot of people aren't going to be wanting to get to. So I like Simon Oliveira this week. I think he's very, very sneaky and somebody who's probably going to be one of the lowest owned fighters on the slate. But with that being said, what we can do now is get into actual tournament builds. So these are for your GPP contests, these are for your single entries, things that you need to do to win all the money. So let's go ahead and pull this back up. Like I said, there are a couple of fights that you need to target. There are a couple of fights that you need to get right. I think the Terrence McKinney Bonfim fight you probably need to get right. I think the co-main event and the main event are all fights that you need to get right this week. So if you pull up your lineup, you enter all six of them. Now you just need to pop out ones and replace and you can do this, especially if you're building multiple lineups. Like if you play the $3 or 20 max, you can build your lineups like this start popping pieces out and putting new pieces in. Let's take a look at what that would look like. So I'll start with how I think the fights are going to go. I like Jamal Hill, I like Brandon Moreno, and I like Ishmael Bonfim. Salary wise, this puts us ahead of starting schedule at 86.33 left over. What I'm going to do is I'll probably take another underdog, somebody like Munir Lazez, 
I have 9250 left over. Now I can grab somebody like Greg Rodriguez. 9400 left over. I can come right here to Tiago Moises. I've left 400 salary on the table. This is different enough. I feel good about this lineup. If I want to come down from Moises, I can come here to somebody like Simon Oliveira, and I could even come off of Greg Rodriguez and come all the way up to J. Alton Almeida, another situation where I feel good about it. Now, let's say I came off of J. Alton Almeida. I came here to somebody like Johnny Walker. Let's say you weren't crazy about Bonfim. Well, then you can come right over here and you can grab somebody like Worley Alves, who I think is live for a finish. You can also come down if you wanted to and grab somebody like Luan Lacerda. Let's say you have Neil Magny for the upset. Now you've got a ton of salary left over and this is where I think you can get even more creative where you could take out somebody like Ishmael Bonfim if you wanted to. You can come up to Greg Rodriguez, who I think is very live for a finish as well. 300 salary left over. I don't mind it. Let's say you came off of Greg Rodriguez and you said, I still want to attack that Bonfim McKinney matchup. Well, then you plug McKinney in. 900 salary left over. You could take out Neil Magny, you come here, you've got 7,800 left over, and then you can come right here to Munir Lazez. 400 salary left over. If you wanted to sweeten this deal a little bit, you could come off of Johnny Walker, or you could come off of Simon Oliveira, and then come all the way up here to Tiago Moises. You've spent all the salary, but I think this is different enough. You can come off of Johnny Walker and go right back to Simon Oliveira. There are a lot of things that you can do. Now, if you thought that Jamal Hill was going to lose and you'd like to go over to Shara, that opens up a little bit more for you. You have 700 salary left over. Come off of Moises. Come all the way up to J. Alton Almeida. Come off of Almeida. Come off of Simon. This is where you would grab Moises and you would grab Greg Rodriguez. It sounded like Scooby-Doo just then. And then you have 200 salary left over. So if you like Davis and Figueredo, boom you could still do that so a lot of ways for you to be able to attack it in that respect just to give you a couple more looks let's say you went with greg rodriguez tiago moises ihor pateria and then you come to jamal hill you come to brandon moreno you've got 6600 left over so you're going to need to make some changes here this won't work completely so this is probably a situation where I would come off of Ihor Pateria and I would go grab Johnny Walker or Simon Oliveira and come back here to Neil Magny. You've spent all the salary, but this is another way that you can attack it. Now I'll build a lineup for you that I think a lot of people are going to run with. Again, I think a ton of people get to Gilbert Burns this week. I think a ton of people get to Terrence McKinney. I see a lot of people playing Jamal Hill. Brandon Moreno as well. They're going to come here to Daniel Marcos, and then they've got 8,200 left over. At this point, they're probably going to play somebody like Paul Craig, if I had to guess. Leaving 700 salary on the table is something that a lot of people probably aren't willing to do, so they probably would come off of Gilbert Burns, grab somebody like J. Alton Almeida, and feel better about the less or fewer dollars of salary that they left on the table. You might see people go the other way in the main event or the co-main event. I think more people, though, will definitely go with Brandon Moreno, but I do think that Glover Teixeira carries comparable ownership to Jamal Hill. Now you've got 8,400 left over. Worley Alves, just given where we land salary-wise, might be attractive. Or you're going to see some people come down from J. Alton Almeida. And this is where you're going to start to see the Johnny Walker come out. Then you're going to see people go back to Gilbert Burns. And obviously, this is not a bad lineup, right? You have knockout upside, knockout upside, finishing upside, 25 minutes to work, first fight of the night and a striking advantage, and obviously some finishing upside with Gilbert Burns. If you sent me this lineup, I'd probably tell you to come off of Gilbert Burns and just attack a better matchup with Greg Rodriguez. Your lineup is your lineup. If you send them to me, I'm not going to tell you to change everything i might say i don't know if i like this guy or i don't know if i like this fighter or i don't know if i like this person but it's normally going to be one change because i don't want you to change everything you picked these people for a reason but use the tools that you have at your disposal and the tools are just the huge fighter pool we have 30 fighters to choose from this week so it's easy for you to get different try new things this week let this be the week where you take risks let this be the week where you play fighters who maybe i'm not talking about maybe your favorite handicapper on youtube isn't talking about wait i said me and your favorite that's the same guy but you get what i mean like if you see people saying oh yeah i'm all over this guy i'm all over this woman i'm all over this guy don't be afraid to zig where they zag if you're playing constantly week in and week out and you find yourself just losing or just not having that one fighter in your lineup that you need to make things work don't be afraid to change things what's unique about mma dfs compared to nfl or nba or mlb is that it's year round you have so many opportunities if you have the same philosophy each and every time these are the guys that i like and these are the people that I don't like, so I'm not going to put them in my player pool. And you find yourself on the wrong side of the DraftKings scoring each and every time or way more often than not. 
don't be afraid to change some things. And I know what you probably think when you're building your lineups, you probably think the same way that I'm describing right now, like, oh, I like these guys, but it hasn't been working for me. But I think that if I deviate from the way that I've been doing it, this will be the one time that it comes through. The UFC is putting on damn near four events every month, plenty of cracks at it, plenty of bites at the apple. So don't be afraid to try something new every now and again, because it could really pay off. And I've had a lot of you guys specifically said to me messages like, hey, I tried something that I thought was stupid or I tried something that I thought was crazy with my lineups and it actually ended up paying off. Thank you. So just a little a little DFS psychology lesson for you there. And now just to conclude, we're going to look at a couple of props and you could take round props and fight ending props on your sports books and things like that. But if you want better odds and a better way to attack it, I would suggest looking at underdog fantasy. Underdog fantasy is a pick em type of style. Now you could do best of all drafts and normal DFS drafts for other sports like football, basketball, baseball, soccer, things like that. For MMA, you can do pick them. That's over and under when it comes to specific props, and they have one or two for every fight, sometimes even three. And I'm going to show you here just three of them that I think make a ton of sense this week. Johnny Walker knockouts over one, over a half, so it means he wins by knockout. Even better than a knockout would be a finish line, which you get here with Ihor Pateria at 0.5. So if he finishes the fight by knockout or by submission, you get paid. I also like Tiago Moises finishes at 0.5. I think that he finishes this fight. Could be a ground and pound TKO. It could be a rear naked choke. But and same thing with, you know what, same thing with Greg Rodriguez. I was only going to do three, but take let's take a look at four. If Greg Rodriguez wins this fight by knockout, if you go four for four here on your picks, you've made 10x on your money. So I'll just show you what that looks like. If you were to put a $25 bet in, you've made 250. They also offer insurance, which means you don't need to hit all of these, right? So you'll see here, I'll pull it down again. You'll see the multiplier right up here, 3x, 6x, 10x. So if you only just wanted to do two of these, you're looking at 3x. And that might not seem like a lot when you look at that number, but that's the same as getting plus 300 odds on your sports book. Getting 10x would be plus 1000 odds, which is pretty nice. And it goes all the way up to plus 20x. So let's say we just added one more here. Let's say we went with the J. Alton Almeida lower than 17 and a half significant strikes. You're looking at 20x, $25 at that point pays you out 500. Another cool thing they offer here is insurance. You can click that here. And if you do that, that means if you go four out of five, you still make 2.5x on your money with this situation. And you'd still make 10x if everything came through. And let's say we took out a couple of these. So let's say we took out J. Alton Almeida. Let's say we took out Greg Rodriguez. You can still make 1x, which would be the same as getting plus 100 odds on your sports book, and you could still get plus 3x if you were to get all three. But this is a situation where you only need to go two out of three to be able to make the money that you've put in and double it. And the cool thing about this is that this goes on during all the fights. You're not building lineups. So let's say you took Daniel Marcos or Simon Oliveira and you were on the wrong side of it, and now you're dead in the water after the first fight. So this is a way that you could continually have some action on the fights during the fights, and it's a fun way to play. If you're interested in your own account, you can sign up with my link that will be in a pinned comment under this video, or you can use promo code Kunith when you sign up on their website, and they'll match your deposit up to $100. So you put 50 in there, they're gonna give you 50 to play with. If you put 100 in there, they're gonna give you 100 to play with. Use that free play money conservatively. And I say that because a lot of people, when they see the free play money, say, well, let's just send it on a parlay because it's not my money anyway. The smart thing to do is be conservative, as conservative as possible with that free play money because as soon as you win it becomes your money i'm not your dad right i'm not trying to tell you what to do but I, I just like to be able to give you the best advice possible so you make responsible decisions and you have fun betting because betting is a lot more fun when you're actually making money right right if you've made it to this point in the video i really do appreciate it thank you so much for watching make sure you like the video subscribe to the channel if you're new comment something for the algorithm i'm going to pin the one dollar winner take all contest as well so if you want a chance for me to kick your ass and take a dollar of your money you can go ahead and hit that link it's a private contest last time we got up to about 50 people in it the time before that i think it was around 80 people the more the merrier the bigger the prize gets and it's just a dollar most of you guys have that in crowns so feel free to hit that link and if you don't know how that works feel free to leave your DraftKings username in the comments and I will add you right then and there and I will send you an invite so that you get it as a notification on your phone you can enter the contest and then it's go time do you have what it takes we'll find out